And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone listening to RBLR Sports. This is James Knowles coming at you for the RBLR Rowdy Show. I'm here with my usual co-host, and I'm going to ask you, Carlos, how are you doing this week? James, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for asking. What a weekend at Alang. What a yeah. time. What a time to be alive. It was Sunday, fun day. I mean, it really was just a great time um, over there at Alang Stadium. So, yes, it's the beginning of the new week, and I could not be more excited uh, with the great result this weekend that we'll get into and an even more fun matchup coming up this weekend. James, how are you doing? You know, I'm not doing too badly. My fiance has COVID, but uh, I have no symptoms. <laughs> Apparently, okay. I, I am immune somehow. I uh, had, you know, my vaccines and my booster, but that's all I've had. And uh, she had the same, so I'm not entirely sure how I have avoided it, but uh, apparently, uh, apparently I have some extra special blood. I, I don't know, but, um, there it is. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm feeling perfectly fine. And, uh, as unfortunately was not able to attend the Rowdies game like I had planned, but you know, there were a lot of plans that were broken this weekend related to the Rowdies, unfortunately. <laughs> You'd be right. You'd be right. Oh my goodness. If you or anyone, you know, anything, if you've been keeping up at all, with anything on Twitter, I'm sure you saw what's going on with the Rowdies and how they struggled to get back home from Tulsa. I'm like, I think they got stuck in Texas. Am I right, James? That was my understanding. What a time. What a time. Flights getting canceled left and right. The world's going crazy. But the one thing that seems to be back to normal is that the Rowdies are victorious on the field. Once again. And that's, like, and that's a good way game. to that's a good yeah. way to uh, get back to the hometown and uh, you know get back to winning ways. So we have uh, like I like we've alluded to here, we've got two games to cover from this past week: a one-one away draw at FC Tulsa, and then a one-nil home win versus Louisville City. Uh, we neither of us gets any points for the game against Tulsa because we both predicted a win. But against Louisville, we did also both predict a win. I I predicted the correct scoreline. So, Carlos, you get one point and I get three points in our personal standing. So we'll keep track of that. And then this upcoming weekend, as you said, the Rowdies have an away game to the Miami FC down in Miami. The only professional soccer team that currently plays in Miami shot at MLS. Uh, we have one other major piece of news that we will have to revisit later, um, not only today, but later on when more stuff comes out. But Lee Cohen has left the club. Uh, we obviously wish him all the best in the future. I think he's done an amazing job with the Rowdies. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's he's done an incredible job as, you know, uh, the, the director of the club, essentially. And I think that he's, um, you know, possibly going to be missed because I only say possibly because we don't know who's coming in to replace him at this point. So. Um, like I said, thank you, Lee Cohen, for everything that you've done, and we obviously wish you all the best in the future. Before we get into those games, I just want to quickly say, please follow RBLR Sports on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We are at RBLR Sports, and please like and subscribe to our podcast on all major podcast platforms. Now, Carlos, if you could take us through a quick review of the game away to FC Tulsa, I will take the Louisville game, and we will then move into our questions and our analysis. Of course, of course. As you touched on, as you mentioned just now, the Rowdies had a game last week, last Wednesday, against FC Tulsa all the way out there in Oklahoma. It was the first time the Rowdies traveled out there to Tulsa and played against Tulsa over there at their home field. Previously, the Rowdies had hosted Tulsa twice, um, so definitely a historic moment in that they had a chance to go out and play at that, well, sorry excuse for a soccer field. I'll say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> There was a baseball clay out there. Everything was just rubbish. The grass was all over. The anyway, whatever. Let's talk about the game. All right. So we had Cochran in goal, as per usual now. Aaron Guillen started with Jordan Scarlett and Thomas Van Kazel in the back line. Uh, in the midfield, we had Jake Arman, Wyke, Hilton, and Dahlgaard. And that front three that has started to become a little more traditional now uh, as part of Neil Collins' kind of new offensive approach. Leo Fernandez, Jake LaCava, and Kyle Gregg. The Rowdies scored first with a great play created. Uh, some great interplay between Jake LaCava and Leo Fernandez created a beautiful opportunity for Kyle Gregg, who, you're going to hear this a couple times, hit the post against <laughs> FC Tulsa. Uh, 
luckily, Lawrence Wyke came out of nowhere from the top of the box and ripped a shot that would end up in the net. 1-0 Rowdies. But despite many more chances with, I believe, at least one more post for Kyle Gregg. It might have been two more. I can't, I'm not recalling right now. But Kyle Gregg had missed a couple open chances. And the Rowdies would only score that one goal and would eventually make a silly mistake in the back that would allow Tulsa to even the game up in the 82nd minute. Unfortunately, another example of the Rowdies failing to capitalize on some offensive chances over and over. A really tough game, really tough game, because we really had that game kind of you know in the bag. We had a lot of chances to finish, and we're just you know unlucky to finish with the W. Um, came back home with a draw. But that takes us into our game from this Sunday. James, take us away and take us through that beautiful game against Louisville. Yeah, so as we usually do, let's go through the starting 11 here. Um, actually, you know, before that, we should even make mention about, you know, obviously there was the game itself, but there were all of these off the field distractions. Yes. So if I'm not mistaken, and this is all from, you know, uh, Twitter reporting from different people and uh, all sorts of different sources, actually. But if I'm not mistaken, most of the Rowdies players who were up in Tulsa, they had to leave, uh, I believe, the airport in Dallas and they were. Uh, still stuck there until Friday, Saturday morning up through Saturday night. So, um, you know, that is obviously not the ideal situation when you're trying to go into a game against a heated rival, but that is what the Rowdies had to deal with. So they eventually get home and they had to reschedule the game, which was supposed to be Saturday night. It moves to Sunday, and that is where we pick up with the starting 11. That was CJ Cochran, Aaron Guillen, Lawrence Wyke, and Jordan Scarlett in the back. Jake Arman, Jan Ekra, Lewis Hilton, and Connor Antley in the midfield. Leo Fernandez, again, in that kind of number 10 kind of winger role, depending on where he goes. Jake LaCava and Kyle Gregg up top. So an early injury to the Louisville goalkeeper, kind of scary moment. Uh, that and some swings in momentum really characterized the first half before Leo Fernandez won a penalty from, you know, very good Rowdy's pressing it was, actually, and... Um, you know, you just kind of like to see how well the Rowdies can do that when they get their triggers right and they get the uh, positioning right for where they're supposed to be to prevent a team from playing out of that press. Uh, that was the only goal of the game, though. And when um, when we got that penalty, the Rowdies were able to hold pretty much <laughs> Louisville to nothing in the second half. You know, the uh, the second half, actually, we're going to go through those statistics, but there were no chances, no big chances created in the second half for either team. So, you know, you can look at that as the Rowdies not doing much off offensively, but I th really think what they were doing is making sure that defensively they were solid, and uh, they certainly did. So that will do it for our two quick reviews. And, uh, Carlos, let's just jump into our questions here. Um, taking these two games as a whole, let's say looking at it as 180 minutes, um, how much of this – time let's say do you think was actually played well if you have a percentage or maybe even a block yeah no i think across both these games i'm gonna break it up into let's break it up into four halves right i think we played three halves really well honestly like especially taking into account the circumstances that you mentioned about you know being stuck <laughs> you know across the country i guess different players being stuck on different parts of the transit back home. I mean, that game against Louisville, I, I would say it was 90 minutes of good soccer. I think we played the first half well. It was pretty back and forth. Louisville had their chances, but we held them to zero shots on goal throughout the whole game. And I think that penalty, um, like you said, was well earned. I mean, Jake Armand did a really, really, really good job of kind of starting that press over there on the left side of the field that would eventually lead to that mistake, um, where I believe it was... I think what's his name? Charpy, the Louisville center back who yeah. uh, committed the foul. Uh, you know, there's always some controversy about whether a penalty is a penalty or not. It looked like a penalty to me. I mean, it's going to be called most of the time when you put your arms over somebody's shoulders. You know, that's never going to end well for you. Um, and luckily for the Rowdies, it didn't end well for them. Uh, Leo Fernandez put in a beautiful little penalty right down the middle. And then the second half of that game was just solid defending. I mean, I think we finally got over that kind of hump of not being able to solidify the clean sheets that sort of characterized our defense last season. Um, 
So I think, you know, holding in there the way we did, I think that's two good halves of soccer. And then going back to the Tulsa game, that first half was good. I mean, we played well. We really did play good soccer there. Um, it's just really the the lack of, of finishing there. And again, I'm going to refer back to Kyle Gregg hitting the post multiple times and missing an open goal. That's really what came back to bite us in the butt. I mean, a silly mistake in the defense is going to happen every once in a while, and it did. Uh, it was just a lapse in coverage there. Um, but I think losing that game just comes down to not finishing tan- chances rather than not maintaining the clean sheet. Um so I would say we played a good 75% of these two games well. Uh, it was good soccer. We played well, and I think we deserved uh, the win, especially against Louisville. And I think the result against Tulsa might have been a little unfair for us just based on how many chances we created. But at the same time, I mean, you could just as easily say that it was fair because of how we weren't finishing those chances. So it's a toss-up, but I, I, I like it. I think we played really well these two games. Uh, just got a little bit unlucky out there in Oklahoma. James, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, definitely the Rowdies played the majority of these two games very well. And obviously it's something that we've noticed before, um, you know, the lack of chances. We're going to get into that specifically next, but um, or the lack of uh, scoring chances, I should say. But right. um, yeah, the one thing that I think that we do need to take into consideration is, um, like you said, the defensive solidity with this team especially in um, these two games and, you know, going back a little before that uh, with the one versus Phoenix, I think that we're starting to look at possibly something that is coming together a little bit better than we have seen. So last year, as we've hit on before, you know, the Rowdies just had five in the back. Well, let's say three in the back line and then the two wing backs, let's say, but the three in the back line almost never changed. We always had Aaron Gee and Forrest Lasso, Jordan Scarlett, And they were only missing games if they were, you know, injured once or twice, I think, probably not even that much. They only missed a couple minutes here and there when, like, Forrest Lasso was subbed off at halftime in the final or something like that. That When you have players that play together that frequently, they develop an understanding of each other and what they're going to be able to do and um, also, you know, what they can't do. So if you think about what the Rowdies have had to do this year to make up for Forrest Lasso's absence – there's been a lot of chopping and changing, and you know this is something that we've covered and everyone else has covered as well. I don't want to belabor the point over and over again here, but um, you have to, you do have to find some consistency, or you need to plug and play players that are ready to, you know, lock down certain opposition players. And if that's what you're going to do, then fair enough. But I think what we would really like to see is some, uh, some real consistency with the choices in the back and the fact that Thomas Van Kazeel came in and he was able to get significant minutes in not just one, but both of these games. I think that that's going to really help us get some consistency back there because that's what we have been lacking in my opinion, in addition to, you know, any other things that we have mentioned in other times, I think that really getting the same three players, getting some decent understanding and getting them a a run of games is going to be helpful. Again, we'll have to chop and change at certain points. There will be injuries. There will be suspensions. There may even be a time when, you know, a certain player just matches up with an opposition striker a lot better than somebody else. And we'll have to uh, deal with that when it comes. But I really like the availability of players that we have at the back now. And I really think that that kind of came in very good in these games. The only problem obviously was the, the one goal that we gave up against Tulsa. They had been playing long balls a lot in the second half. It was something that really, they didn't seem to have, you know, a way to play out of the back with the ball on the ground. Our pass, our ability to stop their passing game certainly was, is very good, but Ultimately, when you play these long balls, um, the the point of that is to get it to somebody who's going to be able to knock it down. And once the ball is on the ground, somebody is going to be there to follow up and just get that second touch. And that's kind of what happened here. It wasn't the second touch. It actually fell down from uh, a ball to Machuca Ramirez, a great name, but um, (laughs) uh, it came off of his chest, I think. And then Connor Antley was actually there to defend it. But when he knocked it away, he unfortunately knocked it right into the path of that Rodrigo da Costa who came in for Tulsa and ultimately got his fifth goal of the season. So, you know, that that's something that's hard to defend. As you said, it's a mistake. 
Um, it's it's uh, something that happens when you're in defense. You know, um, Neil Collins will point this out sooner than you or I will, but you can have a game where you don't deserve to give up any goals and you might give up one or two even, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's just the nature of the game. It's the nature of sport. And um, I think that regardless of us having given up that one goal, we still did show ourselves to be pretty good and on the right track, certainly. No, for sure. And, and I think I want to mention Van Kazel here again because – it's worth noting how well he played in that game against Tulsa. Yes. I really, really loved how he played against Tulsa. And I made it a point, especially, obviously, he's the new signing, to keep an eye on him specifically. And I think sometimes that can make it kind of a bit of a, I don't know, unfair perception of how a player plays because you notice like every kind of little flaw they make and every little mistake they make. Um, you watch like their off-the-ball movement. You're like, maybe you could have done something better here. But he really didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I was watching him the whole game and he just played a really good, solid game. Um, He added a bit of a, you know, dynamic, uh, distributive play out of the back that um, I think Aaron Guillen does well sometimes, but I think it comes more natural to Thomas Van Kazel, um, who's played more of a defensive midfield role in the past. Right. Um, He just fits in really naturally back there and it was really good to see him play so well. surprised a little bit honestly to see that uh he wouldn't he didn't come in until i think he came in the 90th minute against louisville um maybe it had to do with that quick turnaround it probably had to do with the quick turnaround especially with him being the new player um still building that chemistry um but obviously it worked out so i'm not going to complain about a shutout um and who did and didn't play against louisville um but yes, Van Kazel had a great game, and, and I think you're totally right when you say we're kind of on the right track with figuring out that back line puzzle right now. Um, that kind of flipping that, if we look on the other side of the field, the offense kind of seems to be a weird puzzle that <laughs> isn't really being solved yet. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, Kyle Gregg had those multiple chances in Tulsa that he just didn't finish. Um, against Louisville, I don't I can recall one shot that he had that was relatively significant. Um, it was kind of like that narrow angle shot from the right side of the field. It was kind of like, just like, you know, a shot towards the lower right side of the goal, I believe, with a lot of pace. Um, it was a good shot, but, you know, really was never threatening for the goal. Um, if we look at the other two forwards, uh, Jake LaCava and kind of Leo Fernandez, who's kind of stepped into more of this attacking role now. They're playing really well. They're creating a lot of great chances. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, James, that I think Leo Fernandez is playing some of his best soccer this season right now. Um, that interplay with between him and, and Jake LaCava is just so fun to watch. Such oh, great, yeah. like one touch passing. Um, they're really, really clicking, um, which is great to see um, for especially for a guy who just came into the team this year um, between him and in La Cava. And even Kyle Gregg got in on that uh, one touch passing against Tulsa, which was fun to see. But that being said, we're not finishing the chances we're creating. We're creating the chances, but we're not finishing. Why do you think that is? And what do you think we need to do to fix that? Yeah, this is um, this is a problem that I'm sure will keep Neil Collins up at night as the Rowdies coach. But, um, you know, Kyle Gregg has come in, I think, not because he is um, not because he was originally brought in to be the number one choice necessarily. I think that um, Steven Dos Santos was signed last season and he did a very good job for the time that he was on the field. He faced, you know, a, a little patch of injury in the middle of the season. And then um, other than that, he did very well. Uh, we dealt with the issues that we dealt with partially because he wasn't there last season. And I think that Kyle Gregg coming in was the answer to the fact that we didn't have him for, you know, as long as we did. So with all of that in mind, Steven Dos Santos has not been at the last two games. I haven't had a chance to ask Neil Collins about that. And, you know, hopefully we'll get some answers at some point, but in the meantime, Kyle Gregg has been the guy to come in and fill that role. Like we expected him to now, Um, He's actually done pretty well, like you said, in terms of getting himself into the positions where he needs to be to score. And that's really good. Um, Obviously, you want to have somebody who is capable of making those runs. 
and uh, smart enough to make those runs, I should say, not necessarily capable. I'm sure they're all physically capable, but you got to have the mentality to know where you need to be at certain times. And I think that Kyle Gregg has proved himself able to do that, not just with the Rowdies, but all over his career so far. The problem, like we said, has been finishing. And it's not that, you know, it should be noted, I guess, that Kyle Gregg is not ever a golden boot type of winning um, uh, striker. He has not been that for, you know, the majority of his career. And that's the nature of the position. You know, not everybody is going to be. It obviously goes to one person every season. But I think that Kyle Gregg, um, he he's – it's just another one of those things with – you know, we've seen it with Sebastian Guanzotti too. And that's mm-hmm. that's kind of what's going on right now with the Rowdies, I would say, is we have all of the capability of defending pretty well now that we have, um, you know, the back line that we have and all the available options – we also have, I think, a really good attacking unit. We just need to put it all together. But yeah, how do we do that? Um, all of these, all of these strikers at the moment seem to be misfiring. We have Jake Lacava, who's doing very well, kind of coming in off the wing, not necessarily like out wide, but you know, he's starting in um, the half space as it, as it's called, and he's trying to dribble a couple of players, and he's having a lot of success there at times. Leo Fernandez playing in this more attacking role, like you said, also doing very well. But our strikers are the ones who are the getting into those positions and then not being able to finish. And that is literally what they're getting paid for. So yeah. What is, what is the issue there? Um, You know, everybody can just from our side, from our position on the sidelines and um, not going to any trainings. I don't know if you've been to any of the trainings, Carlos, any of the open ones, but I have not. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that we could just, you know, yell from the sideline or hold up a banner that says, uh, do more, do more, uh, finishing practice when you're, when you're in those sessions. But I think that that would be a lot more antagonistic than it would be helpful. I'm really not sure, you know, where, where do they need some confidence for one thing? Every striker will tell you that, you know, you get one and you kind of get that monkey off your back and then you're ready to go. But even Sebastian Guanzotti has gotten himself off the mark. Actually, Kyle Gregg has scored, I believe, at least once this season. I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but yeah, one um, goal this season. Yeah, yeah. So um, they do have at least the one. They just need to get one or two more on a consistent basis, and then I think that that will give them the confidence to keep going. And you know, we've said that in the past, but um, I, I, I don't know what else at this point. You know, we're waiting for it, it's. No. You have to. You also have to have the mentality when the ball comes to your foot and you know where you need to put it to just, uh, this is something that Connor Antley has said in the past. You need to have the mentality to be able to slow the game down in your head, focus on what you're doing, make sure you hit the ball correctly and don't do it so fast that you hit it the wrong way or with the wrong part of your foot, whatever, and then put it wide or something. It's just um, maybe they're, you know, maybe they are uh, under so much mental pressure to be the one who can actually get these goals that unfortunately they are not. Mm-hmm. No, for sure, and and I pulled up the the stats while you were talking here about you know who our leading scorer is. I think everybody knows right now that Jake Lacava is our leading scorer. He has six goals on the season, but it's a little concerning when you look up the fact that we've played fourteen games now, and you know looking at our primary strikers or strikers by like a natural position. None of them have more than one goal. I mean, Dion Harris has two goals. Dion Harris has more goals than <laughs> all of our actual strikers, which is a little concerning. But at the same time, we're still scoring goals. I mean, Jake Lacava is putting up good numbers. Leo Fernandez is, is stepping up, um, being a more of a machine for goals than, than I think he was at this point last season. So that's not to say we're not scoring, but there is something weird going on, something psychological, probably more than anything at this point um, with our forwards, because we know they're talented. We know our strikers have what they need to be successful. They obviously have like a supportive midfield. They have the weapons around them that they need. I don't think we can really point to one thing that we can say for sure. that This is why the strikers aren't scoring. Right. I think it's 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 a tough question, and, and I know, like you said, it's probably keeping uh, Neil Collins up at night. He's probably in there every night trying to think of what the answer is for that. Because right now, it's starting to seem like everything else is going right. Um, defense is playing well. The midfield is, is, you know, really creating a lot of chances, and he kind of 
created something special with that Leo Fernandez, Jake LaCava duo up top. That's kind of facilitating those chances. Now we just need that last piece of the puzzle. We just need the strikers to find their game again. Maybe it's time for Gwenzadi to kind of, you know, he got his time on the bench. Maybe it's time for him to start playing more now. You know what I mean? I mean, he's been on the bench for a, a while these past few games. Um, maybe it's time to put him back in. I mean, he, he's a proven goal scorer. Maybe he learned his lesson on the bench. Who knows? We'll see. We can only see. And uh, it'll be a good opportunity this weekend, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But moving on, I digress. We had one game where we shut out our opposition and one game where we didn't, right? And the game where we shut out our opposition was arguably, you know, the team that's probably the best team in the league right now in Louisville. Absolutely. At the same time, we let in a silly goal against, you know, a team that's really struggling to find their form in Tulsa. Why do you think that is? Why why'd we let up a silly goal to a Tulsa? But come in after all this adversity, after all this struggle of trying to get back home and having to move the game back a day, how do we come back home and just shut out such an offensively talented team? Yeah, I think this comes down to the way that we lined up against Tulsa for one thing, and then the way that we lined up against Louisville. Um, for you know both teams, I think that we did a very good job of shutting down their ability to play through the midfield and trying to pass the ball. I don't know that that's entirely Tulsa's game anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. that's a lot more Louisville's game, let's say. But um, you know they they generally obviously are the more talented team. Um, Tulsa eventually, you know, when they found that their passing lanes were closed, like I said earlier, they just reverted to those long balls over the top. Right. And long balls are a lot harder to judge, you know. I think one thing that we had last year that is a difference between um, our defense and now our defense then and now where that would have really helped is actually just having a six foot five force lasso at the back. You know, right, that's right. that's a huge impact when um, you have a team lumping balls up top. And I think that that would have really come into play against Tulsa because there was that kind of diminutive forward Machuca Ramirez that I was referring to. He um, he was the one that they were lumping a lot of these balls up to. And he's not a tall guy. Right. Um, you know, I should mention that Aaron Guillen, Lawrence White, Connor Antley, Thomas Van Kazeel, whoever you have back there, they should probably get on the end of those headers, but they're not going to get on the end of every single one. Right. I mean, even Forrest Lasso doesn't get on the end of every header and he's six foot five, but he certainly has a better chance of it. So I think that, you know, if they're going to start doing that, probably you're going to have one or two fluky bounces after it hits off of his body somewhere where, you know, he's getting bumped around. He's not even that tall. So it might not be his head where it lands. Who's to say, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it ended up falling to um, it's falling to the feet of another player after it bounced off of him. And uh, Connor Antley was there to step in as the defensive presence, but he did not clear it as much as it bounced off of him and then into the path for Rodrigo da Costa. Now Louisville, were not playing that way. Louisville were trying to maintain their game as they would. And um, if you, you know, try to watch the way that uh, Tampa Bay defended, I think that they covered all of the midfielders that they would like to build with pretty well. Corbin bone was pretty much shut down, you know, in their midfield. Mm-hmm. So you got to note that they did very good. They did a very good job at that. And then um, going down the wings, Brian Ownby on one side was, um, you know, really, really, he got a couple of good chances. I I will have to say he, you know, he did obviously get some good chances. And that's the same, again, that's the same thing with uh, those long balls up top. Everybody's going to have something go their way, but it depends on how how good a chance you can create by doing that. And uh, obviously Louisville were not able to create a good enough chance by the way that they were doing their game and trying to beat us. And Brian Ownby, as much as he got into some space at times, he never found himself in space enough where he could beat a player and even get a shot off. There was usually a player and then another player behind him ready to block that. And that was just, again, down to the good shape that we had and the players that we had attacking their guys with the ball so that they had to usually play it a lot more early to their options up top, like Cameron Lancaster or Wilson Harris at times than they would have liked. And Wilson Harris was, you know, you could see that there too, he was not able to bring the ball down in the way that he would have liked to Mm -hmm. get a shot off. 
Um, we obviously shot off all of the angles that would have allowed him to do that. And I think that that comes down to, again, you know, us having the, um, us putting that pressure on their players when they have the ball and they want to distribute. And then also very good marking at the back without actually any of those lapses in defense that we've seen those momentary lapses. Right. No, I, I, everything you said is spot on. I'd agree 100%. I, I, the only chance I can think of for Louisville that really scared me was what would have been one of the flukiest goals we've ever conceded if it went in. It was that Wilson Harris chance that he got one-on-one with CJ Cochran off just that dumb free kick. If you, you know what I'm talking about? It was earlier yes. on. Yes, that's half. right. Yeah. I, I forget who. I might have been Ownby. That quickly. I'm trying to find that in my notes here. Yeah, it was it was a foul from some Rowdy's player earlier on in the first half, um, and Louisville wanted to play the ball quick, and they did, and somehow Wilson Harris found himself one on one with C.J. Cochran, and by the grace of God, he just shot the ball wide. He just <laughs> he just missed the net. Yeah. So we got really lucky there. But that goal was also would have been just so dumb because the ball was still moving when the free kick was taken, which is obviously not allowed. That's not how free kicks work. I don't know how the ref missed that or how he just let it happen. Refs are usually pretty good at just not letting free kicks like that happen. It's probably one of the easier things to stop, um, especially when they see the ball moving right in front of them. Nonetheless, they had that chance. Almost scored. Luckily, they didn't. And that's really the only chance I can think that really scared me. You know, I, I was standing there behind the goal um, in the standing supporter section um, with my girlfriend who was visiting from New York. She got to go to her first Rowdies game. Got to awesome. See a, a win. That was so fun to be at. Um, and that was the only chance I could see from behind the goal that really scared me. I don't know if I'm if I'm missing a chance or if, if, if you can think of another thing. But, I mean, apart from that, I mean, we did a really, really good job of, of – I think what we did was adjust to the team that we're playing really well for this, this particular game against Louisville. Kind of like you said about, about you know, adjusting our tactics to our opponent. I think we did that really well for um, Wilson Harris, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, he is a great player, but he needs a very particular kind of f- game flow for it to work for him. Um, he needs a lot of, you know, through balls, a lot of balls that will go kind of like where he needs them to be. Um, and, and the Rowdies were just doing a great job in that back line of kind of stopping that pass from even getting to him in the first place. Yes. Um, so I, I think that was the key for stopping Louisville in that first half, because I know he got subbed off in the second half. In the second half, they didn't create anything, really. I mean, if you go back yeah. and look at the highlight video um, from the USL, the Rowdies in Louisville, I mean, there's literally no, like, nothing from the second half. It's three minutes of first half highlights and then, like, a good 10 seconds of the last free kick of the game, which kind of just, like, skipped across the face of goal with no real danger. So, I mean, we played a great game against Louisville, and I think that was the key for the shutout, really, was just playing to our opponent's style. I mean, there's a time to kind of, you know, play your game you know, as, as, as the cliche goes. Um, but this was the time to kind of play Louisville's game on this, to play our styles to how they play um, and adjust our defense, our back line, our midfield to kind of stop it before the Louisville attack even gets dangerous. And I think we did a great job of doing that. So, yeah, um, to follow up with what you're saying there, I, I, I want to um, back up everything you're saying with the defensive side because – Um, we obviously try to play our game most of the time, but I think this game was a lot more, not necessarily reactive because reactive means like, you know, uh Oh, you've lost the ball. Now you better get yourself somewhere to try and stop it. It was definitely proactive, but it was proactive on a defensive side and to back, um, all of our, all of our statements up here. I just want to go through these statistics really quickly. Like I had mentioned, I would earlier, um, let's look at the halftime statistics. So I wrote this down. At the time, it was uh, 46% to 54% possession in favor of Louisville. And then the shots were 11 to 2 in favor of us, 4 on net, 0 on net for Louisville. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, and then the chances were two big chances to one. And I believe that that equates roughly to, you know, is similar to X, X goals, expected goals. So, um, yeah, th that's kind of what we, that's kind of what we looked at from, um, the first half. We, again, like you said, we allowed Louisville to play their game, but we got ourselves into positions to prevent them from actually doing anything with it. So you can have it on the back line for sure. You can have it there in certain situations. And then we're going to press you when we see that you're about to do something that we don't want you to do. And we're going to prevent you from trying to make those good passes that you think you're going to make. Other than, like you said, the Wilson Harris one. Wilson Harris, in fact, was so negated by these tactics that he was subbed off at halftime for uh, Cameron Lancaster and Paolo Del Piccolo, someone who is l literally a USL championship legend because of how many games he has played for Louisville City. He was also subbed off at halftime for Enoch Mashugalusa because they were having no you know, ability to create anything playing that way. So we go to the second half and they do try to you know, continue to play their game, obviously, just because mm -hmm. they made the substitutions doesn't mean they're going to change everything. Ultimately, we get through the second half and we went through those statistics from halftime. Like I just said, let me do the ones at the final whistle, 40% to 60% possession in favor of Louisville. So again, we let them have the ball up to a certain point and then we try to prevent them from getting those good passes in. Now, again, the halftime shots were 11 to two in favor of us. The end of the game shots are 12 to five. <laughs> we had wow. one shot in the second half and they had three. If you look at the shots on target, again, at halftime, it was four to zero in favor of us. At the end of the 90 minutes, it was four to zero in favor of us. Yep. So you got to look at this. Again, the big chances, two to one in favor of us at halftime, two to one in favor of us at the end of the game. So, you know, we did really well to, like I said, shut them out. We did not focus on getting forward if we really didn't have the opportunity to in the second half. And I don't mind that as somebody who... You know, I just want us to go out there and win, damn it, <laughs> you know, right, right. but um, it, I'm sure it would have been more entertaining for the average fan to um, see us go after it a bit more. But hey, that's the kind of difference here is you've got to grind these games out. And that's something that Neil Collins mentioned after the Tulsa game was we did not right. grind it out just like we wanted to, even if, you know, it came from uh, a fluky goal more so than a goal that Tulsa worked their way to get. And it was beautiful soccer and all that stuff. You right. still a goal is a goal. You want points. And ultimately, we got three out of this. We grinded that result out. And if that means that we didn't get, you know, we only got one shot in the second half, so be it. Um, but, Carlos, I do have a question for you based on everything that I just said there. Do you think that we snuck by Louisville with that penalty? Now, I know, obviously, the circumstances were pretty bad for us to play this game against Louisville City. And that's a, a bit of a feat in of itself. So talk mm -hmm. to that and, and the penalty in that game. In short... No, I, I don't think we snuck by at all, honestly. I, th I think we deserve to win the game. We played better than Louisville. Um, I mean, we just shut them down. I, I wouldn't say we were, you know, offensively thrilling, like you said. It was a bit of a grind. But we frustrated Louisville enough to take out their leading scorer at halftime uh, in Wilson Harris. I mean, we just did our thing, and, and we, we played them perfectly. We shut them out. That doesn't really happen a lot for Louisville. I mean, we're talking about one of the most talented teams in the league, um, arguably one of the best teams in the league. Uh, I mean, with this win, we kind of knock them down a little bit. Uh, I think Memphis took over the first spot in the East now. Um, I don't think it was a fluke at all. I, I don't think we snuck by them. The penalty was well earned. It came from really good pressure. And I think it was a pretty clear penalty. Um, you know, again, like I said earlier, uh, it was Charpy that kind of went over Leo Fernandez's shoulder with his arms. It's not going to end well for him. Um, I think we deserved it. We created more chances than Louisville did. So even if you're kind of just looking at it that way, uh, you know, we created more and, and we defended well. I think we defended and, and played one of our best defensive games of the season, um, which is really saying something, uh, especially with under the circumstances of, of having literally just gotten back to Tampa Bay, in some players' cases, the night before the game against Louisville. Um, so all in all, I, I, I think we deserve to win the game. I think we played a really great game, and, and I wouldn't even call it anywhere close to a fluke. Um, I don't think we snuck by at all, and it was a huge win. It was just a huge win to kind of get us on track after uh, a tough, you know, 
sort of last minute draw over there in Tulsa. What about you, James? Would you agree with me? Yeah, I mean, overall, I would definitely agree with you. I think I'm a little less certain on the penalty. And, you know, that doesn't matter right? because it was called and uh, it, right, it turned right. into a penalty and Leo Fernandez slotted that home. So it really doesn't matter what I think or not. Um, the one thing that I will say related to that that I have in my notes, um, Wesley Sharpie, I do kind of wish that he was a Rowdies player. I got to say, he's a very good defender for one thing, and he is a local boy. Um, really? He grew up playing, if I'm not mistaken, for Clearwater Chargers, and then he went to USF. Huh. So, um, yeah, it would be really nice to, you know, I love having local players around like Juan Tejada. Like um, if we, when we had Darnell King, that was always a good time because Darnell literally went to, you know, Gaither High School. If anybody's familiar with that in North Tampa, that's where I went. And, um, and then he uh, played, I think, for FAU, one of those ones. And then, um, you know, he came back and played for us for a little while. Uh, it would be good to see him at some point. I, I, like I said, Wesley Sharpie, Ben Sweat is another one who was a Clearwater Chargers player and then went to right. USF. These are all players that I would love to see play for the Rowdies just because I like the local guys. But um, other than that, uh, yeah, it, it would be it would be um, interesting to have him back here. But it, it, and while he's away at Louisville, I certainly don't mind him giving penalties away to us. That's <laughs> that's pretty good. That yeah, is pretty cool. Double agent, um, double agent. Exactly. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Um, one thing, one last question that I have for you, Carlos, before we get on to our man of the match. I think Louisville at this point is div- like we've got some sort of hex going on when it comes to playing Louisville. <laughs> I can't yeah. imagine how frustrating it must be for them to come to, uh, you know, we beat them obviously in the Eastern Conference final in dramatic fashion in Louisville in uh, 2020 before we are unable to play in the uh, final for the whole league. You know, that sucked, obviously, but we did beat them there, and and that was that was an amazing game. I imagine that Louisville didn't expect there was any way they were going to lose that game. Um, so we get that one. Then we go next year, and uh, we played in, um, I think, you know, the, the final that everybody saw against Louisville City in Tampa Bay at Al Lang, where we're down. We're losing, and we come back, and we score in the the absolute last second of the game to tie it up, take it to extra time, and then we beat them again. And then, you know, they're coming back here. I'm sure they're looking for revenge. They're at the top of the, the East for most of this season. Tampa Bay seems to be having, you know, a rougher season than most, and we still beat them. We, uh, we haven't even been able to get the team into the city for most of this week, and we still beat them. I can't imagine how frustrating that must be and how hard it is for them mentally to play us in the future. Right. No, it's definitely weird because, you know, I, I looked back at, um, kind of like the head-to-head history in Louisville, and it really does feel like we've beaten them more than we actually have. <laughs> I mean, you look back, and, and we're actually even. They have four wins against us. We have four wins against them, and we've uh, drawn twice against them. So it's exactly even. But it really feels like, I mean, it. I think it's pretty obvious to say we've had the two biggest wins against them in the conference finals that we've played against them. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, we really could not beat them over there at that, what was still a baseball stadium over there at Slugger Field. Um, but once they moved over to uh, their new stadium, I don't know, maybe we uh, turned something on and realized, wait, we can actually win um, playing on an actual soccer field. Uh, and we started doing that, and, and they've really been struggling to beat us ever since. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is. Uh, they're obviously a really, really talented squad every year. Um, I don't know. I, I think that game from this past season in the playoffs, the lucky M. Kosana, you know, legacy night, it might take a psychological toll on them for sure. I mean, it's like, oh, God, we're going back to where, like, that happened. The unspeakable yeah. event happened. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I still remember I was actually up at Georgetown. Um, I was on a retreat in in the woods, in, in the Blue Ridge Mountains up there. And I remember I couldn't watch the game because I didn't have enough like data up there. But I got notifications from Fought Mob, and that's how I was keeping up. And all of a sudden, he goes back to that goals on my notifications. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? I saw the highlights <laughs> later. And, and even just seeing those notifications makes you feel the emotion. And I, can't, I, I can imagine. I mean, I'm sure there's Louisville players that, you know, struggle to get that out of their head. And I mean... It's tough to like be that close 
to another final and another trophy. Um, and, you know, I guess throwing it away in the last minute. Um, it was special for us, for sure. I, I don't know if we have, you know, some sort of rent-free living in their head. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but, but we're playing well against them, and that's all that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's do our man of the match. Carlos, who was your man of the match for uh, the game in Tulsa? And then who's your man of the match for the game here at uh, Al Lang against Louisville? Give me Leo Fernandez for both games, James. Leo Fernandez, like I said earlier, has been playing some of his best soccer of the season right now. Obviously, he scored the penalty and drew the penalty against uh, Louisville. But, you know, even if you scratch that, I mean, he has been kind of the driving force behind all the chances that we've been, all, all the really dangerous chances we've been creating. Like I said earlier, uh, especially in the game against Tulsa, is the one that kind of sticks out to me the most, was that one touch passing and the interplay he's been able to create with Jake LaCava especially, and even with Kyle Gregg. Uh, the fact that he's been able to create that with Kyle Gregg, I think, is a testament to what a great playmaker he's been over these past few games, because Kyle Gregg is not meant for that kind of play. Kyle Gregg is a body that you kind of just put in front of the box and hope to get a header or, or be in the right spot. But even, he's even managed to bring that interplay, that one-touch passing out of a player like Kyle Gregg and created a ton of great chances that unfortunately we just didn't finish against Tulsa. Um, but he did create that goal uh, against Tulsa. He wouldn't be credited with the assist because Kyle Gregg would hit the post <laughs> and then uh, Lawrence Weick would come in and finish that. But he got the sort of moral assist for that because he created that chance. He put in that cross that hit the post. Um, and then obviously against Louisville, he would score that goal. So I'm going to take Leo Fernandez both games. I think he stood out as my star um, across both games. And especially, you know, I'm going to say even more in that game against Tulsa um, because of how much he was creating. And unfortunately, just you know, we're getting unlucky with, obviously, like we talked about earlier with the finishing. But, yes, Leo Fernandez across both games. James, who are your men of the match for Tulsa and Louisville games, respectively? Yeah, so I am obviously also very big on Leo Fernandez right now. I think that um, his work in this new role, again, not a new role, but a new role for the Rowdies, team and um i think that he's just doing it so well he's playing it and creating so many awesome opportunities i will say for the uh first game against tulsa i did want to take jake Arman, and my reasoning is a i re i was really you know very hyped when we signed jake Arman to start the season and then um i thought that you know he would ultimately allow leo fernandez to move up the uh i thought he was going to be playing as a left winger of sorts and then Sebastian Guenzotti is a right winger. That was how I predicted the season would go. It hasn't quite gone that way, as we can all see. But Jake Arman does still allow Leo Fernandez to step forward into this role that he's been playing. And in this game against Tulsa, he had a couple statistics that really helped him out here. 79% pass accuracy. Not too bad there. One chance created, just like Leo Fernandez. One blocked shot. 67% successful dribbles. So that's not too bad. And then he also had two clearances for interceptions, five recoveries on the defensive side. I think that overall his play was very good and it allowed, like I said, Leo to step forward. But in the second game, I think there really is no argument for me. It's Leo Fernandez. Everything that you said is true and everything more like he's he's we're running out of superlatives for these last couple of games, honestly. Right. Right. Yes. I, I can't I can't explain enough how much i've loved seeing leo fernandez play these past couple of games and another quick shout out an honorable mention for that tulsa game uh i want to give one to thomas van kazel um because he played again a great game in the back it really showed me a new uh element a new side uh, of this rowdy's back line that he can kind of bring out um for the team moving on let's quickly look at the standings James, do you want to run us through the standings and how we look after this incredible weekend of exhilarating soccer across the league? I can do that. I can do that before we move into our preview of the away game. So this weekend has now changed things up a little bit. Memphis still lead in the East, though. After Louisville City's loss, they have 28 points from 12 games played. Memphis are coming a little bit out of the blue. 
Um, if anybody remembers from our uh, show with Mike Watts before the season started, I did say that I thought Memphis was going to be doing pretty well. I did not expect them to do this well. So I will I will uh, not say that I predicted this or anything. They are doing pretty darn well for you know a team that was really unheralded coming into the season. I, mm-hmm. I thought that they looked better than last season, but nowhere near like leading the East could. <laughs> Right. Anyway, um, they sit in first. Louisville City do sit in second with 27 points from 14 games played. Then Detroit City and Pittsburgh follow. The Rowdies are after them with 23 points from 14 games played. Indy 11 and the Miami FC have 20 points, and I believe Indy 11 still has the capability to overtake us because of their games in hand. Now, let's look out west where Colorado Springs have 27 points from 11 games played. Behind them are San Antonio, also with 27 New Mexico and San Diego, both with 22, and then Phoenix and El Paso, both with 21 points. So it's pretty tight out there in the West. You know, there are a couple of games uh, in hand for individual teams, and that's probably going to change really quickly. You know, one team going to first, another team going to third, so on and so forth. It's uh, it's very interesting to see how it plays out. But I do think that the Rowdies are doing, you know, um, we're looking up, obviously, and we don't have many games in hand with a lot of the teams that we're up against. but if we can grind out some more results like we just did against Louisville city, I think that we have the ability to climb up the table just mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. That that Memphis story is so weird to me. I swear. Like there's, it doesn't feel like there's really anything, you know, I can point to that just points to this random, like rise to the top. It really does feel a little random, but I mean, kudos to them. They're finding their rhythm and they've won seven of their last eight games. That's, honestly incredible so good for them um i do feel like you know i'm not to say we're a better team than memphis but even looking back at that game where they beat us out there um i felt like we matched up really well and i think we can you know looking ahead <laughs> looking way too far ahead to uh you know playoffs and whatnot if you know we have to go out there i do like our odds and i think we can get better by then and I, that would be another great game that'll be a game where Hopefully the Rowdies are even more improved and Memphis is still at the top of their game. They're probably going to improve even more. So I think we're looking at an Eastern Conference, which is only getting more competitive. Um, it's going to be a great time. The playoffs are going to be exhilarating. I think the Rowdies are in for an even bigger challenge than they were in last year. So it will be a great time. But, you know, that's looking way too far ahead. Let's look ahead to a few days from now when the boys go south down to the 305, down to the land of Pitbull and the land of the <laughs> Miami FC. The only team I can think of in this United States of America that officially has the word the in front of their name. So shout out to them for that. That's that's fun. Anyway, it's, it's, it's fun, right? <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's something, but it's fun. So we'll be down there on Saturday. The Rowdies have an away game, obviously. It's their second of the season versus the Miami FC, or their second game of the season versus the Miami FC. The last time we played them, we lost 1-0 at home, as you alluded to, James. Um, I think we can pull off some revenge. Uh, it'll be a bit of a rivalry game. Um, it, it's hard to generate. You know, It's going to sound like a shot at them. It's not meant to be a shot at them, but it's a little hard to generate that kind of rivalry status um, with the team that you know doesn't draw too many fans, doesn't really have a huge Twitter presence um, like some of these other USL teams. It'll still be a good game. On the field, they've been performing pretty well. They've been on and off, um, and it'll be a fun one down there for sure. Their form has been relatively spotty with a home loss to San Antonio, a draw to Detroit City, and an away win versus what James so eloquently noted in the notes here, uh, the punching bag in Charleston yes. battery. <laughs> Poor Charleston. They've only won one game so far this season. You have to have some pity for them, but yes, they pulled off a huge win. Uh, they blew out Charleston over there, and they've drawn twice uh, to Pittsburgh and Tulsa, respectively. The Miami FC likes to line up in a 3-4-3, but they're also known to switch to a 4-2-3-1. So it's a pretty dynamic formation. It's a team that likes to rotate um, and kind of keep you on your toes. One player that they won't have, it's a huge loss for them against us this weekend, is Speedy Williams. However, they still do have a ton of talent and players like Romeo Parks, uh, Perez, Reed, Segbers, and Ba. Uh, and our last game against them came in that really busy stretch of April that kind of you know came with a 
weird stretch for, for like you know off performances uh neil collins was away at coaching training that game i believe out in scotland uh and that was the game that leo was moved up top as a striker uh, <laughs> a really weird game honestly but that's uh, this time around uh we will need to kind of fix those mistakes and we'll have a bit of a improved squad um, we'll be i think more healthy than that game and obviously neil collins will be here to coach anything else we need to keep an eye on james what do you think will happen what do you think we need to do to be the miami fc yeah i think that um a lot of this game is going to come down to not just the way obviously that we defend against them but um of course it is kind of how we play with our intensity so if we go back to that one game john stead was the coach while uh, neil collins was away he said that we didn't get too intense or intent or purposeful about our movement, about our play until mm. it was much too late. And if anybody can think back to that game, I'm sure you will remember we went, um, you know, a very long time. It was just kind of lackadaisical uh, against the Miami, as it were. And if I can go and find that one really fast here, um, they scored in the 51st minute. So obviously the first half, you know, whatever we kind of play kind of play good enough, don't get anything going, don't get anything, uh, don't give anything away, and then we move on. So it gets into, like, you know, that thing that we've seen with the Rowdies where they wait until the last 15, the last 10 minutes to mm -hmm. actually start playing and really, you know, get some intensity about it. Um, I think that we have noted that from different games in the past, and, you know, everybody's going to have an off game. That was an off game in the middle of something of an off month, but obviously April was very busy and everybody has noted that as well. So I think uh, the amount of time that we will have, there should really be no excuses about how we prepare for this game and how the players prepare for this game mentally. You shouldn't have to wait until the last 15, 10 minutes, five minutes to start getting your chances here. And I think that they're going to go in and they're going to want to beat this team, get that revenge, just like I was hoping for. And, uh, yeah, as long as we defend them properly, then, you know, we should be able to put up numbers against this team. They are good, but they are certainly not better than us. On any given day, we are going to be able to beat them, you know, we're going to be able to beat them if we play to our level and they play, you know, if they're not playing out of their heads or something, <laughs> right. then we should definitely be able to keep them subdued. And uh, like you said, Speedy Williams not being there, he is away with the Jamaican national team during what I am enjoying so much, the CONCACAF Nations League. By the way, shout out to that. If anyone is not watching, you you should take some time. There's some there's some crazy goals being scored. There are there are some awesome and awful pitches that players are uh you know out there using, but um, anyway, that is fun. a side. That, yeah, it's been fun, but that is a side note. Um, we should still be able. The Rowdy should still be able to beat the Miami as long as we do what we know we can do as a team. So let's just move into our predicts here and let's try and get some scores out there. Carlos, do you want to go first and say what you've got? Yes, give me two nil to the Rowdies. I think we can roll now another shutout um, against you know again. No disrespect to the Miami FC. Um, but frankly, just not as talented as Louisville. Uh, Louisville has the star power, uh, and we were able to shut them out uh, on really short turnarounds <laughs> with all that adversity, um, barely making it back home in time for the game. I think with all this time, we, we should be able to pull off a shutout, and I think two goals would be honestly a, a, a pretty good minimum. I think if we play our game, you know, if, if – especially if the strikers can figure out what's going on. Uh, you know, I can see a Jake LaCava goal and see Kyle Gregg, even if he, if he stays in the lineup, come out with a goal here uh, against a, you know, what has been a relatively shaky back line for Miami recently. We should be able to pull off a win. I don't see why, why not? I don't see why we wouldn't be able to. I know sometimes we've struggled down there in that stadium in general. Maybe the stadium has a little bit of a curse on us. I don't know. I think we can pull off a win. Um, I'll be trying to make the trek down there. Uh, should be a good time. Anybody listening, definitely take a trip down there if you can. Uh, then there will be a lot of Rowdy's fans making the trek. So should be a good time, and hopefully we leave with a victory. So I'm going to take a 2 nothing win. James, what's your prediction? Yeah, I think that the Rowdies can also get a win here. Like I said, I think the actual amount of preparation that we can put mm -hmm. into this game will benefit us as a team. And, of course, they're going to be a little bit antsy to try and go back and, you know, 
put one back on uh, the Miami after the game that we probably shouldn't have lost but did. So I am also going to take a win. I'm going to take a 3-1 win. I'm going to say that we are winning 2-1 going into, you know, let's say the last 10, 15 minutes where the Rowdies are usually the team that might come on uh, when they're down. And instead, Mm -hmm. when Miami are pressing uh, and trying to get that goal back, we are going to go down on a counter and beat them with another late one and uh, make it 3-1 there. So that is my prediction. Um, I would, yeah, I think that I will try to get down there. I'm not entirely sure if that's something that I can do at this point. We will have to double check with the family and all that. But um, yeah, I think that it's entirely possible that there are going to be more Rowdies fans than there are uh, at this game than there are, let's say, Miami fans in existence, because I don't know how many there are who, you know, one thing that you mentioned that I wanted to just re-mention i miami aren't even on twitter that much are they i mean you know it's one thing if you have uh a fan base that isn't gigantic or anything but they're you got to generate something right you got to generate some interest or at least try i don't see that from the miami on on twitter you know they'll post their scores or whatever but um maybe you know you don't have to do all the bands from the, from the team's account or anything, but uh, you got to put something out there and get the fans interested. I would say there's such a weird, like atmosphere around that club. And again, no disrespect to them. It's a good team, (laughs) but I mean, it's, I, I I think back to that. uh, I don't know if you saw the U S open cup draw when they were drawing the the teams and the matchups for the round that would eventually like Paris up against Orlando and Miami against inter Miami. They had a supposed representative from the Inter Miami fan base and the the Miami fan base, and the the fan that they brought in from the Miami FC was this like DJ, who somebody <laughs> said like they pay to be at the game sometimes. It's just this DJ lady, and, and it was such a weird time. It was a weird stream. It was just a it's a weird time all around. And I know like they have their supporters group if you ever seen the game if you ever been down there they have like a band that plays at the games um and i know like when they had a game that it was the game against pittsburgh that they played i don't know if it was last week it was relatively recently there was like a storm that came through or or no no sorry sorry the power went out at the stadium there was no lights at the stadium for a little bit and um the band just like left at some point Somebody oh my on, lord <laughs> yeah somebody had said on twitter that like you know they hadn't been paid for the rest of the game i think that was a joke but i mean i could totally see it being a thing that they just you know they weren't paid for that extra two hours that they had to wait so i mean it's, it's a weird vibe over there but it's <laughs> the last time we went down there it was pretty close there might have been the same number of Radu's fans as the miami fans so still it'll be a good time it's a, it's a pretty <laughs> nice stadium down there. I love going down there. Uh, Miami is always a good time. Um, and I know uh, Ecuador will actually be playing a friendly against Cabo Verde and Fort Lauderdale on the same day. So I'll be down there for at least one of those games. We'll have to see which one. I'll definitely try and be at the Rowdies game for sure. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, it'll be a great time. So hopefully come out with the win. James, do you want to wrap it up here for us? Yeah, we have our one more thing segment, and there are a couple one more things that we want to go through here. Um, First, obviously, liking and subscribing is free, but if you think you might need some new threads coming up for this season or the rest of the season, it is obviously very hot. Maybe you want to change up your look and get something that's a a little cooler to wear outside. You can support this podcast as well by heading over to shop.rblrsports.com and checking out all the stuff that we have going on there. Please, if you'd go, you will find the link in the description and you can use the promo code C-O-Y-R and get 10% off who does not love a discount. Please check it out. It is a lot of fun to see what uh, our producer, Rika, comes up with. He's got a lot of cool ideas. A couple other things that I wanted to mention for one thing. We did have a special episode that came out last week. I had an interview with former Rowdies player Andres Arango. He actually won the NASL in 2012 with the Rowdies. Um, That was, uh, you know, the new iteration of the NASL, which has now also pretty much ceased to exist, but whatever. In the meantime, Andres Arango did win, and uh, he has moved into the coaching arena. Uh, For anybody wondering, the magazine Soccer America has had this uh, little this little series recently where they interview recently retired players who have moved into the coaching side. 
And I was inspired by this. I thought, you know, this is a really cool series. Why don't I take up the same mantle and just start reaching out to the players that I can see? Uh, Andre Sarango was gracious enough to grant us an interview. And um, as I said previously, I know that we had a lot of interviews over the year 2022 so far. And I still really think that the one with Andre Sarango was probably the best one that we've had. I, I, it was great. It was really cool. He gave some really interesting insight into not only his life, but his career as a player. And then now he, ta- he told me, you know, what he sees as a coach. And um, I, I really liked getting his input there. He has, you know, some critiques, certainly. And he also has some advice, all that kind of stuff. I, I found it very uh, enlightening for somebody who is not a coach or a player, of course. But um, yeah, he's got, a, he's got a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Um, additionally, uh, please check that out. But additionally, I want to say congratulations to Diego Luna, who moved from El Paso Locomotive to Real Salt Lake in MLS. I believe his reported fee, you know, it wasn't it wasn't um, printed out on their press release or anything, but the reported fee was roughly 250000 something like that. That's an incredible, that's an incredible fee for an MLS team to pay a USL championship team for one of their players. And I think that Diego Luna deserves it. He's already made his debut for them in a Friday game against Vancouver and, uh, or their Saturday game against Vancouver Whitecaps. Yeah. He's, he's looking like he might be the real deal. And that's just awesome for not only El Paso or Diego Luna, but the USL championship as a whole, it, it's going to, um, it's going to lead to some good things. Finally, the last thing here, Lee Cohen, we talked about him a little bit. And, um, you know, his move away, uh, we don't know what that means for the team as far as I'm aware. I mean, Carlos, what do you see from this? Do we really have any idea at this point or is it kind of just waiting to see? Yeah, I haven't seen anything, honestly, about anybody coming in to replace Lee or anything like that. But I did see, I forgot who reported it. It was one of our local reporters here that said uh, it looks like he left on his own will for personal reasons uh, i want to say i saw something about uh, spending time with his family and whatnot so obviously very valid reasons and we we just love lee so much here in the raddies community honestly it, without him i mean this team is not what it is today i mean we can say that about a lot of people and it's kind of a cliche sometimes for stuff like this but i think it's genuinely very true for lee he's just been around for a decade at this point he's been a constant in, in some of this change and change in ownership from Bill Edwards to, to the Rays. Uh, he's been that constant there for everybody who's been around for a while. Um, and he kind of, well, not kind of, he made us what we are today. Uh, he's been integral in the front office. Um, and he just understands the fans in a way that a lot of executives and higher ups and presidents and in, in most sports really don't. Um, he is truly a part of the community in a way that just most executives aren't. And you can see that by the way he knows people in the fan base. He can know people by name. Um, one time I was saying, like, just great job to him. And he said, oh, thank you, Carlos. And I'm like, what the hell? He knows my name. Like, I, I've never talked to him at this point. And he just says my name. And stuff like that just really makes you feel like you're a part of the community and he's a part of the community. So we don't know anything about a replacement or anything like that but we do know that whatever happens that lee cohen's legacy is forever marked on this team and its successes um in the coming years so huge huge thank you to him he is everything to this club and again we wouldn't be what we are without him yeah, I think that that's very important to note. And, you know, he did he did develop um, a bit of a personality walking around at games. He not only, like you said, he would he would definitely know fans and he would recognize fans like I think very few club directors probably would. But um, there were a couple of times that he would go out with the flamboyant rowdies gear. I think that there was a jacket or some pants. I, I don't remember which one it was, but um, ahead of one of the playoff games, it was <laughs> he's he's a very cool guy. He will. Um, definitely try to mix it up with people out in the, you know, in the tailgate and actually through the stands during games, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we we um, appreciate him here at RBLR. And of course, like I said earlier, we wish him all the best because that is what he deserves for everything that he gave to this club as a member of it. So that will do it 
for this week. And uh, we want to say thank you, listeners, for tuning in. We have gone a little bit long this week because we've had to cover two games. We've had to preview one, and there's all sorts of stuff in between, obviously. So thank you if you have gotten this far. We really appreciate it. And, of course, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at RBLR Sports. Please recommend us to people, obviously. If you have made it this far, I imagine that you are, uh, you know, you get something from this. So make sure that other people can get that same thing from us. If you want to get at me specifically, I am on Twitter at RBLR James K. Carlos, where can they reach out to you? Come by on Twitter. My at is at Carlos TPA 10. Uh, I was looking back on my feed. And I've been basically exclusively retweeting Rowdies and Tampa Bay Lightning content. So a quick shout out to our Tampa Bay Lightning, who are playing a huge game tonight at the time of recording this um, in about an hour. So this is a make or break game for them. We'd love, love, love to see them come out victorious. Um, It'd be a huge win for Tampa Bay. So shout out to them and best of luck to them. And... Yeah, that's all I have on the Twitter. James, you want to close us out? Absolutely. So please like and subscribe to our podcast. We're on Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as YouTube and all other major podcast platforms. You can check now us out and not only our show, but also the RBLR Lightning Show, the RBLR Ray Show, the RBLR Bucks or Bandits. We've got it all covered here. Please tune in. And for us here at the Rowdy Show specifically, we want to say... Come on, you rowdies. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.